Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Jennifer Nordstrom, and I'm honored to serve as the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's senior minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all you're bringing with you today and all your heart longs to set down. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests who are joining us today. If you're visiting for the first time or joining us from afar, why don't you say hello in the chat now and tell us where you're joining us from. I welcome everyone into our worship service by inviting you to repeat our first church mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Let's go now to our beloved sanctuary to light the chalice which is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Good morning. My name is Joby Clark and I am your worship associate today. I have a reading I'd like to share from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of humans and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain, these three. And the greatest of these is love.
That first Corinthians chapter 13 passage, love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things is the reading at so many wedding ceremonies. Maybe you've been to a wedding ceremony that had this read at it. Maybe it was read at your own wedding ceremony. Reading this as a wedding text takes a text that was written about love in community and it applies it to the intimate love between two people. In its original context, however, it was talking about how to build the church, how to build a community of love on the foundation of love. In Unitarian Universalism, we often equate the word love with the word God, sometimes even interchanging them. When we think of love in that sense, as the holiest of holies, as the greatest, most powerful, most sacred force on earth, we might be able to expand our understanding of how that larger love that holds us and bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things is a big love. What does it mean when we bring that big love, the love at the expansion of our consciousness down into human size, into our bodies, our lives, into concrete decisions and communities and living relationships? Because this is how most of us live practically in real choices that we make each day and the ways that we show up in our relationships. Our earliest Unitarian ancestors argued that it was our human goal to become as much like God as possible so that we might live more beautifully and harmonious, harmoniously here together on earth. What would it mean to become more and more like love every day. Can you imagine yourself turning into love, turning into love itself, slowly, gently morphing into love? When I imagine that, I see my own particles sort of floating up and glittering into light, gently twinkling and blinking equanimity and joy. When I imagine that, I feel more rested, more content, more connected. I feel more capable of showing up in love in relationships that are human <laughs> and complicated and messy. I feel, I feel more capable of showing up in those relationships with compassion and care. And I want to return to that last line of the Corinthians reading. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Many times I have heard this line be interpreted as self-erasure, as one person in a relationship or a community bearing, believing and hoping and enduring all things. In the book, Proverbs of Ashes by Rebecca Ann Parker and Rita Nakashima Barak, Reverend Dr. Parker tells the story of a time early on in her ministry when a woman visited her at the Methodist congregation she was serving to ask for help 
understanding what love would do in this woman's situation. The woman who came in asking for advice had just walked in off the street because she saw the name Reverend Rebecca Parker on the signboard out front on the church. And she came in asking what a woman priest thought of her situation. She sat down with Reverend Parker and told her the story of her marriage. For more than 20 years now, the woman's husband had physically abused her. Early on in their marriage, the woman had gone to her own priest at her own church and told him what was happening in her marriage and asked him what she should do. And he told her some version of love endures all things. He encouraged her to use her abusive marriage as an opportunity to become more Christ-like and to continue loving her husband and bearing the abuse in order to become more Christ-like. When Reverend Dr. Parker heard this story, she had to pause in a moment when she felt the wind rush out of the room. And not only because what the woman's priest had told her was so shockingly wrong, she was also shocked because the week before, she herself had preached a sermon that had a similar theological message with different examples, of course, ones that feel more intuitively right. But the theological message was along the lines of love endures and bears all things. There she was sitting in her office with this woman who was holding up a mirror that reflected back to her exactly how that theological message of love bears all things can go so terribly wrong. Taken to the extreme, this loving intention can end up encouraging harm and even in the worst cases, abuse. In that moment, the Reverend Dr. Parker realized that she needed to shift her theology and challenge the theology of love bears all things and endures all things and look at how love can be loving with boundaries. Now, as Unitarian Universalists, some of this kind of theology lives in our congregations too. Sometimes it's in the vestiges of our denomination's Christian history, or in the ways that our members and ministers as well carry their own religious pasts into the community. Sometimes it shows up as a twist on our Unitarian Universalist first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of all human beings. Congregations can justify accepting all kinds of behavior because of the inherent worth of the person that's exhibiting that behavior. But love and inherent worth don't mean that we either as individuals or as congregations need to be on the receiving end of harm, of difficult or harmful behavior, and certainly not of abuse. We don't even really need to be on the receiving end of rudeness because love and inherent worth and dignity are a two-way street. In reality, that street goes more than two ways. Love and inherent worth move in all directions. They encompass all people and beings. You are beloved and inherently worthy. Everyone is inside the infinite circle of belovedness and inherent worth. Going back to the Corinthians passage, one translation of the original Greek text says, 
love protects all things, while another translates the same text as love bears all things. I like to understand that language, love bears all things, as love holds all things. Not that love bears all behaviors, but rather that it holds all beings within its circle and nothing and no one is left out. If we think of love as that big love, all encompassing love, the love beyond us and surrounding us, that means that we ourselves are part of what is being held. And while love is enacted in our relationships, it's lived out in our relationships, love is not only the interaction between two beings. It is not something that is just within me or that I do. It's rather a state of being that envelops and holds and protects all within it. The big love bears us, all of us, in all of our complexity, and it protects all of us. Boundaries are how big love loves. Boundaries are one of the ways that big love protects all the beings within its circle. A few times now in this sermon, I've said you, you are part of the all that's being held. And as you've been listening to the sermon, you might have located yourself within it somehow. Have you imagined yourself in a love with boundaries situation? And if you have, are you the person who needs to set some boundaries to protect yourself from behavior that's causing you harm? Or maybe you're watching a loved one who needs to set some boundaries? Most of us are going to connect more quickly with those two situations either being on the receiving end of some behavior that's causing us harm or witnessing it in one of our loved one's lives. But there have been times that every single one of us, including me, has also been the person that's been enacting harmful behavior. All of us have hurt someone that we love. I'm gonna tell you a story on myself so to begin with, let me just tell you that I'm not good at cooking. I'm not, I'm not good. Anyone can tell you that. I'm capable of it, but it's nothing to rave about. And I'm not one of those people who's like, ooh, I love cooking. It brings me such joy. No, it's definitely in my life a chore. In my worst moments, though, when I'm exhausted or down or overwhelmed, it's worse than not being good at cooking. In those times, I'm not good at feeding myself well. <laughs> the whole process of planning food, getting it from the grocery store, preparing it, and then having it readily on hand for when my body is hungry, that is a weakness that can crumble when I am under-resourced. When I first moved here to Milwaukee and began serving First Unitarian as your senior minister, every single system in my life was new. Everything, work, home, my personal life, and my resources were pretty low. On my worst days, I wouldn't pack a lunch or even remember to bring snacks to work, and then I would book back-to-back -back meetings without enough time to even run and get takeout to eat. On one bad day with high stress and no food in sight, I phoned a friend and I asked for help. 
my friend came to my rescue in that crisis moment. A full meal was delivered to my door and I was able to show up to my meetings on time and fed and resourced and feeling good. Now, that would be a happy story if we ended right there. But that one friend rescue was not enough to fix a systemic problem in my life. And my brain learned a short-term lesson in that moment of rescue that if I really got stuck, I could call my friend and get bailed out. My brain, which was already running on empty thought, this is a much easier solution to this problem than fixing the entire system. And so I called on my friend multiple times over the next month or so. And one time I got angry with them when I was struggling and was depending on them to show up with food again. And they said, no, they couldn't do it. After that, my friend needed to sit me down and set a boundary. They had to let me know that it wasn't okay for me to depend on them for this basic need. And it really wasn't okay for me to have expectations that they would meet it and get mad if they said no to a request for help. A one-time crisis situation was one thing. But shifting to a system where my friend was the backstop for my systemic food planning deficits, that was different. Now, let me tell you, I wasn't particularly happy about that boundary. I didn't like it. Having food delivered to me when I failed to plan well for myself was working for me. But it wasn't working for my friend. And they needed to set a boundary with me that would rebalance our relationship. In the renegotiation of needs and boundaries, I needed to figure out how to get my food needs met in a way that worked for me and worked in this relationship I had with my friend. Writer and embodiment practitioner, Prentice Hempel, writes that boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and myself at the same time. Negotiating needs and boundaries is a normal part of loving relationships. Renegotiating them is a normal part of loving relationships. It's a feature not a bug. Relationships are messy and all of us have needs that we try to meet through a variety of strategies. Sometimes those strategies work in our relationships and sometimes they don't. As we negotiate needs and boundaries in the normal course of human relationships, we should ask ourselves, is this a strategy that holds and protects all inside the circle of love. We are allowed to have boundaries and so are our loved ones. In a community, we have to keep negotiating needs and boundaries. That's a normal part of learning how to be human in relationships with love. We have to keep negotiating and renegotiating with the people we love as we grow and as new conditions emerge. Sometimes you're the one who gives, sometimes you're the one who takes, and often it shifts. Our needs and boundaries are constantly changing in a changing world. When things get out of alignment, we need to stop and listen to one another and renegotiate boundaries that keep everyone's needs met, keep the community going and flowing, and keep everyone held and protected in love. It's messy, it's complicated, and sometimes it includes disappointment or loss or frustration. That's all normal. 
the key is to keep remembering that everyone has inherent worth and value and everyone is within the circle of love, the circle that is infinite and boundless beingness that holds and protects all. When we remember that, we can keep learning together what boundaries are needed to keep everyone protected and held and well and needs met within that circle. It's not easy, it's not static. Rather, it's a moving and with attention, sometimes even beautiful dance of discovery. We honor the circle of love and enact love through dancing with one another in our relationships. That reading from 1 Corinthians ends with love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. Now I only know in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith and hope and love remain. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. Our partial knowledge is just that. It's partial, it's particular, it's human. And in those particulars, we need boundaries to be held and protected and well in our relationships. But the big love that holds all is so much bigger than us and our particulars, and it will last beyond us holding generations upon generations into the future. The particular is a dance that we do today and every day, learning with one another how to enact love in our small individual relationships. But we need to remember every being is inherently worthy and held in something so much larger infinitely large. And the greatest part of that is love. May it be so, and amen. It has been a blessing to be together. May you go out from here nourished and renewed and use that to choose to bless the world. Until we meet again, may you be held, may you be healed, may you be whole. Blessed be and amen. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, we know within. And we will get there Heaven knows how we will get there But we 